Okay, here we are. Welcome, everybody. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today's class is all about the civil rights movement of the 1900s. So we're going to dive deep into it, really focus on that 1950s, 1960s time period. And I'm going to walk through some major organizations, some fascinating people, and some major changes to our Constitution. And to do this great work in this class today, we are here with all of you, but also one of our top scholars, Tom Donnelly. Tom, would you like to say hi to everybody? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. We are kicking off the new year with our favorite topic, the Civil Rights Movement. Dive into it, or I guess it's your second favorite topic, Tom. Even though I always think of the Reconstruction era and the Civil Rights Movement as something that's intertwined. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, can't separate them. Um, so I thought we'd start off a little differently today. And this um, image was on our website. It was promoting the class. And I, I love this image because when you talk about civil rights, this is not an image that pops up into most people's heads. They usually see the March on Washington, which this is a part of the March on Washington, but they see the forward facing, the, um, the reflecting pool, MLK, people marching, those big pieces. What I love about this is like kind of the casual nature of before <laughs> the shot is taken, how they look. But there was one worry I had about this. I want you guys to look, and this is not a hard question, so don't, don't overthink it. When you look at this and you think about the civil rights movement, and I always like to do this with primary sources, who's missing? Who's missing from this primary source, this image? We'll give you guys a second to answer. Thank you, Roberta. There you go in the chat. You, anybody else can answer in the chat as well. Give you one more minute. But women, women are missing from this image. So when we're talking about civil rights, we need to make sure that we understand who are the main players and also who are the players that we may not have heard of. And women are a huge part of this. Oh, sure. Good one. Some local leaders. There's some national leaders here, but how many local leaders are here as well? Tom's going to walk us through all these faces, tons of amazing women, tons of amazing local leaders, and some of the local leaders that started small and then became national leaders and how that process worked over years. So I think it's an important way to kick off whenever we look at history. We should look at a primary source and say, what's going on in this moment? What was happening? I like to think about what conversation those two guys are having right there because it looks really interesting. Uh, but also, who's missing from the image, from the story, from the source? So Tom, we have so many questions about the civil rights movement and we can dive right into it, but maybe start it off with the big idea. What's the big idea behind this fight for civil rights in the 1900s? Absolutely, so I mean, I think one of the things we always like to go back to when it comes to the civil rights movement is that one way to understand the civil rights movement is as realizing the promise of our nation's founding creed. So our nation's conceived in liberty, the declaration of independence, that is a promise of freedom and equality. We wrote that promise into our constitution in various ways, but we know for far too long that promise wasn't realized for many Americans, especially African Americans. And so the story we're going to tell today is all about the story of how we changed our constitution and America to better live up to those ideals of the Declaration of Independence. And what we'll see is that it's no single person, it's no single person that does it, it's no single moment but it's a really extended period of time and it takes a combination of ordinary Americans, social movements, movement leaders, the Supreme Court, the president, Congress, all of those various entities and people working towards the same goal in order to bring big change to the United States. Oh, that's so good, Tom. That's a fantastic way to set this up. This takes a long amount of time years and years and generations of people pushing for change at every single level of the system and tons of groups and people. So one of the most powerful ways to make change is for singular people to work together. What's the Margaret Mead line? Five great people can change the world, something like that. I'm butchering it a little bit. So let's start with four great people that are highlights of the NAACP. This is our first organizational group what is the NAACP? Tell us about its history. And we're gonna go through all the different groups and how they work together over time to make constitutional change. Yes, yeah, so the NAACP, it's founded in 1909. So even there, you can see, we often think of the civil rights movement as made mostly the 1950s and 60s. The NAACP is older than that. Its mission, you can see right there on their screen is to promote equality of rights and eradicate caste 
or race, race prejudice among citizens of the United States. They wanted to do it at the ballot box. So with voting in the courts, in, in, our, in our schools, at work. And so really throughout American society, their big vision was that what you see at the end of the charter there, that quote, they wanted complete equality before the law. What an inspiring mission that is. The NAACP brings together some really, really important figures. So you can see them on the screen here. Beginning at the bottom left, we see Ida B. Wells. And so she's a courageous journalist and civil rights figure. She studied white violence in the South in the 1890s, late 1890s uh, in the early 1900s. So much of what we know about violence against African-Americans in the South during this period comes from her courageous journalism. She helped found the NAACP. But then there's also W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the great public intellectuals in American history. He was the first African-American to earn a PhD at Harvard. And he was also the author of, among many things, of, of, of an amazing book called Black Reconstruction, which tells the, that story of post-Civil War America through the prism of how African-Americans continued to fight for change. So that's W.E.B. Du Bois. A couple of other key figures with the NAACP's founding, Mary White Ovington, who was a suffragist, a journalist, and again, a co-founder of the NAACP. And finally, there's Moorfield Story, who was a lawyer from Boston and the NAACP's founding president from 1909 to 1929. And I, I just want to pull out, and we're going to hear this over and over again, the First Amendment, talking about freedom of the press with Ida B. Wells as a writer um, and with Mary White Overington as a journalist as well. How much of this movement is utilizing all different parts of the First Amendment? So pulling that out as we drive through. But let's look, you know, part of the First Amendment is the freedom to assemble and to, and to talk to others about what you believe and protest. And I always think of a positive nonviolent protest and think of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So let's yeah, so walk through Southern, this group. Yeah, so the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, in many ways, maybe the most prominent organization in people's minds when it comes to the civil rights movement. It's associated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's founded in uh, 1957. And so some of the key players here, you know, you, see, you, have, you have Dr. King. Again, the central tenet of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is nonviolence. So nonviolent direct action. And some of the key figures, there's Dr. King, but there's also, you can see here in the bottom left-hand corner, Ella Baker, who had an amazing five decade career in the civil rights movement. She largely worked behind the scenes as an organizer. And she really tried to get the movement to focus on two big things. One was to make sure that it wasn't just a top-down organization, but was also from the grassroots up, from the ordinary people upward pushing for change. The other is to make sure that the civil rights movement wasn't just run by men, but that women would have a powerful voice in leadership within the movement as well. Some other key figures in this organization were Ralph Abernathy, who was a Baptist minister, a close friend and mentor to Dr. King. He worked with Dr. King on the Montgomery bus boycott. And he also became the president of the organization after King's tragic assassination. There's Fred Shuttlesworth, who was also a minister from Birmingham and a co-founder of the organization and ally of Dr. King. And finally, there's Bayard Rustin, who is this really cool figure who's both, he's both a theoretician and an actor. He's a man of action as well. So he's a trailblazer of nonviolent direct action, so those big principles that undergird the civil rights movement. He taught those principles to Dr. King, but practically, he was also a great organizer. He organized the Freedom Rides, and he also organized a lot of the logistics around the March on Washington. Yeah, Cheryl and I were just sharing in the chat. It's like amazing human being, like dive deep into some of his memoirs and some of his uh, autobiographies and biographies. Really, really fascinating. Now, another group that we look at as a huge group that made movement is um, Congress for Racial Equality. Sure, so it's, it's formed in 1942. Its big mission is to, quote, bring about equality for all people, regardless of race, creed, sex, age, disability, sexual orientation, religion, or ethnic background. So it's a really ambitious goal. Some of its key players are James Farmer, who's committed to nonviolence. He also organized the first Freedom Ride. Uh, there's also George Hauser, who's a Methodist minister, and finally Bernice Fisher, who was based in Chicago and has been called the godmother of the sit-in movement. Fantastic, and now we're going to uh, Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. Sure, so this is, they're also known as LCCR. It's founded in 1950. Their big role in the movement was to organize big national legislative campaigns. So think about big laws passed 
during the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Leadership Conference is doing a lot of the organizing at the national level. Some of the key figures here are Roy Wilkins, who was active from the 1930s all the way up to the 1970s, so a very long career in the movement. We see A. Philip Randolph, who was a key labor organizer. And finally, Arnold Arison, who was the executive director of the group from 1950 to 1980. He worked with Randolph to help lobby FDR to end racial discrimination in various contexts. And he also helped to plan the March on Washington. Fantastic. Now, Mandy asked a great question, and I think it's perfect to share during this next group as well. So we're going to talk about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, and we can talk about boycotts, sit-ins, and she wanted to understand what are, who were the Freedom Riders and what did they do? Absolutely. So yeah, we could definitely, so the Freedom Riders, we're going to talk about them a little bit later as well. But these, they're these amazingly courageous civil rights uh, 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 activists during the 1960s who take interstate, take buses interstate from the north into the southern states. And their goal is to desegregate buses and the bus terminals all throughout the south. So they're trying to attack Jim Crow segregation head on. They use nonviolent direct act, action to do it. And it's an amazing act of courage. I mean, it's a reminder again for the civil rights movement. We see brilliant people, we see persistence, but there's also just physical courage for these civil rights organizers, understanding that they're going from the North down into the segregated itself. They're going to be met with violence. They're going to meet that violence with nonviolence. They will not exchange it with violence. And so unbelievable courage to expose the injustice and violence of the Jim Crow system. And so when we talk about the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, which is, are those two organizations connected? Um, and also just to point out that a lot of these people are very young too. Yeah, so this, this organization also known as SNCC, this is an organization that really signals the transition in the civil rights movement itself. This is a really, you're curious, it's the really, it's the young folks in the civil rights movement. And so they're formed in April of 1960. It grows out of the sit-in movement from earlier uh, that year. A key figure here that, that straddles the two groups is Ella Baker. So we already talked about Ella Baker when it came to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. She also helped organize SNCC. And so she gets SNCC to focus on really two big goals, nonviolent direct action, but also urges SNCC to not ignore the importance of voting rights. And so it's Ella Baker who ends up teaching many of the principles of the civil rights movement and nonviolence to this new generation of leaders like Diane Nash, John Lewis, Julian Bond, Stokely Carmichael, Bob Moses, uh, uh, and, 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 and all of these people would go on to amazing careers later in the civil rights movement and beyond. And Tom, already, if you guys are, it's really, I, I know we're giving you a lot real fast, but you can hear, you've got the students doing the grassroots level of work with Ella Blaker's influence, uh, nonviolent techniques that they're using, but also other groups are working on the policy and the political side. Other groups are working on national marches. So you can see how this, uh, our professor Jeffrey, who so will be with us on Friday, he calls this a constellation of stars that all work together to build an understanding of how to make this change. But as time's going through each one, you can hear what was their main goal, what was their job, and then how did they all work together to see this beautiful view and to make change. So it's really, really fascinating. And I don't even think we're completely done yet. So the Committee for Equal Justice, we haven't jumped into these amazing women yet, have we? We have not. And so this is an organization that's formed by Rosa Parks and Recy Taylor in 1944. It's focusing especially on equality for African-American women, also exposing uh, 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 you know, uh, drawing greater attention to things like violence against African American women, and so Rosa Parks, famous for not giving up her bus, uh, her bus seat uh, in Montgomery, she's a, she's involved in the civil rights movement for a really long time. She was already at this point in time the secretary of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP, a position she held for 14 years. And then Recy Taylor, who worked with her on this, was raised in the Jim Crow South. Again, both of them, their goal to really bring greater equality to African-American women and to bring greater attention to violence against African-American women. And I'm so glad you brought that up too. Is that we like single story Rosa Parks so much. We tell that one, I mean, it's a powerful story. So that single story is like a more impactful than anything most of us do in our lifetimes. But we single story her and say she sat on a bus, she was tired. And the whole story of Rosa Parks is mind blowing. The constant courage, the constant fight, and 
unbelievable impact that she had on so many people across this nation and protecting women against violent acts because they were African-American women. So powerful. And to remind us, look for whose not, story is not being told and what other stories we can find out about people to unpack the full impact of their life. So, so unbelievably impressive. We see all this work going on at the very grassroots level, at the national level, and this all circles around the Supreme Court. So we need to bring them into the fold of this conversation. Tell us about the Warren Court, which is the name, why is it called the Warren Court? Yeah, absolutely. So the Supreme Court plays a key role during this period as well. Uh, the Warren Court's named after Chief Justice Earl Warren, who you could see on the screen right there. It ran from 1953 to 1964. It's the Supreme Court that gives us Brown versus the Board of Education. Importantly, it's a court that was really allied with the goals of the civil rights movement. And this is notable because throughout a lot of the Supreme Court's history, it was no friend of civil rights reformers. So this is a notable change in the court's role in American society and in the American constitutional system. Um, and, you know, in the end, again, Chief Justice Warren and his colleagues play a key role in pushing African-American rights and also the rights more broadly of, of minorities in the United States. And so making sure those who are unpopular receive their full protection under the Constitution. Fantastic. Now, a lot of our students are like, this is a lot, this is a lot, it's a lot of people. But um, we can share with you the PowerPoint and the notes so you can have everything Tom is saying as well. But one of the things that I wanna say is, hey, this is just this one snapshot of time. This fight for equality, for civil rights started at the beginning. Like Tom kicked us off talking about the Declaration of Independence, saying that this is our guiding star, that we need to align the constitution and align our actions as Americans around. So Tom, maybe we dive into a little bit about the declaration and how people right away in the beginning of our country used it to fight for freedom and to resist oppression over and over and over, even when it was extremely violent and caused their death. Absolutely. So, I mean, these are in many ways the most famous words, maybe, in American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, down by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. These are these, th these words in a certain sense, write a promise of freedom and equality into our nation's DNA. It's America's founding creed. And what we'd see over time in the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, but extending all the way back to the American founding is that we'd see constitutional reformers, civil rights advocates would root their pushes for reform in these words of the Declaration of Independence and its broad principles. We see it as early as 1777 with Prince Hall who was a free African-American in Massachusetts who petitioned the Massachusetts legislature to end slavery in the state saying that's inconsistent with the Declaration of Independence and inconsistent with natural rights. We'd see this similar push with other key figures in the 1800s like Frederick Douglass, who in his famous speech, What to the Slave is the 4th of July, would challenge his white audience to live up to the promise of the Declaration of Independence and to do better. And we'd extend it all the way in to the 1900s and to the heart of the civil rights movement, as we saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his speech in the March on Washington, describing the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as a promissory note issued to all Americans, regardless of their race. And so what we see in each of these cases, the civil rights advocates doing is saying, we see oppression, we see racial discrimination, but in the end, these are inconsistent with America's founding creed. What we're doing is the most American thing and what you're doing is un-American. Fantastic, and I, I, we're gonna keep going on this. I love, okay, so there's power in the declaration to call upon to say we need to, we need to do better. We need to be more to what we believed in our values. But there's <laughs> other parts of our documents that give power to ensure that everybody has civil rights. So let's start with the constitution and then we'll go to your favorite time period, the reconstruction era. So pick us off with the constitution. Sure, so I mean, the civil rights leaders, again, throughout history, they're using the declaration. They're also using the inspiring words of the constitution. Things like the preamble, it's promise of a government by we the people. That means all, we, we, all of us, all of the people, not just certain people. But we also see others point to the promises written into the Constitution after the Civil War, our nation's second founding, these Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th Amendment ratified in 1865, abolishing slavery, the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, promising freedom, of, freedom and equality, the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870, promising to end racial discrimination in voting. Again, what the move here is for the civil rights leaders is to say, look, 
you know, in the face of things like Jim, Jim Crow segregation, separate but equal, racial discrimination, to say that each of these things are inconsistent with the Constitution's text and history. In the end, what we're doing in pushing for civil rights is consistent with the Constitution. We're trying to enforce that vision and enforce that promise for everyone. Fantastic. And now <laughs> let's jump in and we're trying to make sure Tom doesn't die in this class because he's getting over a cold. Uh, we're jumping into three big amendments that changed the Constitution. We have the 13th Amendment that abolishes slavery, 1865. 14th Amendment wrote the Declaration of Independence as promise of freedom and equality into the Constitution in 1868. And then the 15th Amendment banned racial discrimination in voting for men in 1870. I guess, Tom, when we look at these three big amendments, they feel like they should have solved the problem. And each one of these amendments, it says Congress, Congress has the power to write laws to enforce it. But this is 1865, and we've been talking about 1965. So what happens in that 100 years? So, so that's a great question, Gary. After these amendments are ratified, we do actually see a bursting of multiracial democracy in America with massive political participation by African Americans, massive voting by African Americans, office holding by African Americans, everything from United States Senator down to local justice of the peace. But as we know, as we get further and further into the 1800s, we turn away from the promise of the, these reconstruction amendments and all throughout the South, we see a mix of violence, threats and laws, Jim Crow laws in the end, thwarting the promise of these reconstruction amendments, really bringing an entire system of racial discrimination against African-Americans that's ultimately upheld by the Supreme Court in 1896 in a case known as Plessy versus Ferguson. There, the Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson basically says, you know, this system of Jim Crow segregation, it is consistent with the Constitution. It's constitutional. It's in Plessy that we get that big principle of separate but equal, this idea that it's okay to separate African-Americans from white Americans uh, uh, as long as those facilities are equal. Of course, we know they never were equal, but even if they were, if they were, the court is saying that that's constitutional in Plessy. And in the end, Curry, it's gonna take decades upon decades of social movement activism, legal strategy, and ultimately court decisions and laws to undo the damage done and the evil done by Jim Crow. Unbelievable. And I love that you're starting to weave in the earlier courts because Tom said earlier to everybody, you know, the courts weren't known to be supporting civil rights and weren't be supporting of Af African-American voice and agency in voting or in travel or where to live and where to buy and those rights. So I think it's really important that we walk through some of those court cases and see that pushback. It wasn't uh, all members of the court. So do you want to talk a minute about um, kind of some of, it wasn't just like, okay, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do these 13th, 14th and 15th amendment. And the, all the courts turned around. There are a few lone dissenters that push back right away and say, this is wrong. So maybe you can walk us through Plessy real quick. Yeah. So in Plessy itself, it's a seven to one decision. So it's not, it's not unanimous. There is a one. And that one is, is Justice John Marshall Harlan, who pushes back and says, what you're saying court here is nonsense. Of course, Jim Crow is not consistent with the US Constitution. It's not consistent with the 14th Amendment's promise of equal protection of the laws. But John Marshall Harlan famously says is that our Constitution is colorblind. And he predicts that we would look back later and say that Plessy was one of the gravest mistakes in Supreme Court history. And so we do. Absolutely. And so now we kind of fast forward to where we see just one story to kind of show where there's traction, where the civil rights leadership um, uses the courts and says, okay, let's take this systematic work that we're doing at all levels and let's tap for weaknesses and see in the lower courts and build up to the Supreme Court where we can make these changes, where we can push on it. And the strategy behind the Brown case is mind blowing. It's absolutely brilliant that this NAAC legal team spread so far and wide, begins with the college students, and then really moves through the educational system and say, this is how we prove inequality. This is how we prove that we are not living up to our, to our ideals. So Tom, can you walk us through all this maneuvering? Because I think it never gets the credit of how like unbelievably brilliant, perfect mind this mapping is of this work. 
Yeah, absolutely. So in response to Plessy, the, it's the NAACP that eventually adopts a long-term legal strategy to overturn Plessy. And as Curry said, the law often moves slowly. And so they're building up cases upon cases that chip away at Plessy over time and recognize more and more strength in the 14th Amendment. The key architects here are Thurgood Marshall, who you see there on the left, and then his two teachers at Howard Law School, uh, Charles Hamilton Houston and William Hasty. And so this activity all builds up to maybe the most famous decision in Supreme Court history, Brown versus the Board of Education. Brown itself emerges from cases in a variety of locations from Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, Washington, DC. What they all have in common are children and parents, uh, African-Americans who want to go to their local public schools, but aren't allowed to do so because of Jim Crow segregation. Jim Crow segregation saying that African-Americans can't go to these schools, separating schools between African-American schools and white schools. And ultimately what these, these children and their parents argue is that is inconsistent with the Constitution. It's inconsistent with the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And what the Supreme Court says, this is the Warren Court and the decision itself is unanimous. And it's written by Chief Justice Earl Warren. What they say is, you know what? Linda Brown, the Brown of, of Brown versus Board of Education, she's a, a third grader in Kansas. Uh, but Linda Brown, you are right. And we, the Supreme Court, were wrong. Plessy versus Ferguson was wrong the day it was decided. You are right that Jim Crow segregation violates the 14th Amendment. Here's the famous language from Chief Justice Warren. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. <clears throat> so, Tom, this feels like a roller coaster from like at this moment. I know it takes years to get here, but then it feels, at least when you're in hindsight looking back on it, you've got all these moments that boom, 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 and things start to roll. And I know that's not fully true, um, but there's a couple other tipping point moments. And one of our students brought up how much was the murder of Emmett Till which I believe is 1955. So right after Brown versus Board of Ed comes down, how much is the murder of Emmett till one of those tipping points? Yeah, I mean, it ends up being a galvanizing, for, a galvanizing force for the civil rights movement itself, but also what we'll see in various spots here in the 1950s and 60s are just certain you know, acts of violence and gruesome crimes that also galvanize support among moderate white Americans who, who begin to see in a more clear and concrete way the injustice and evil of the Jim Crow system and the, and the murder of Emmett Till in part, I think helped crystallize that. Yeah, and I, I, we need to nod to his mother as well because what she did, which was unbelievably brave, it had an open casket. So the whole world would see the violence because for so long the violence is hidden um, and people are hiding it from themselves to refuse to see the violence. And this changes and it does push up energy around it. And they also see the violence of the young students trying to go to school. So maybe we could roll into Little Rock uh, at this point. Yeah, so it's 1957. It's a reminder this is three years after Brown versus Board of Education, but Brown itself doesn't end school segregation. We see in the South what's called massive resistance by political leaders <clears throat> to try to make sure that Brown doesn't become a reality in their schools. And one key flashpoint here is in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957, nine black students, the Little Rock Nine attempted to enroll at the all white Central High School. And then we see Governor Orville Faubus called the National Guard in to bar them from entering the school with the support <clears throat> of white mobs. And then in response, the national government steps in and President Eisenhower Ike then sends a thousand federal troops, nationalizes the Arkansas National Guard to protect the African-American students and in a powerful speech, addresses the nation, explaining his decision to enforce the law. And then finally, the Warren Court steps in to reinforce President Eisenhower's actions in a case called Cooper v. Aaron. There, the court explains to state officers and governors that they had a duty to obey the orders of the court, even when they disagreed with them. Perfect. And now you're seeing the executive branch come in with some power to support the civil rights movement. Um, I believe it was Farmer that said, you know, like, hurry up, we're getting, you're getting us so cold, we're going to be freezing because there was just no energy around it. Then you see the um, Supreme Court as another branch coming in and supporting it. And now we're waiting for kind of that movement around Congress, writing laws to support the civil rights movement, which reports, supports overall rights. We have the big Montgomery bus boycott. There's the image of Rosa Parks. Um, and really this is 
one of those times when you hear about this moment, you think it's a moment in time, but when you really dig into the history, they boycotted the buses for an extremely long time. And that meant walking for hours every day to your job, to your school, to get groceries. Unbelievable amount of self-preservation uh, to be able to keep doing that effort of work. So we'll go through the, the bus boycotts and the sit-ins and the freedom rides and kind of move forward. Absolutely. So we talked about the civil rights movement inside the courts. This is a lot of what's happening outside of the courts. And so one famous example, the Montgomery boycott, it's 1955. It involves Rosa Parks, who was a civil rights activist in Montgomery, Alabama. And she refuses to give up her seat on the bus to a white man. Uh, she's arrested for violating the law. But this is, again, as Chris said, it's part of a larger strategy by the civil rights movement. Parks herself, again, a longtime member of the NAACP. And they were this but this boycott would last for over a year in Montgomery. So people had to walk to work. They had to walk to school. It was amazingly inconvenient. But in the end, it fought segregation in one of the most segregated places in America. As we roll into 1960, we see the beginning of the student-led sit-in movement in Greensboro, North Carolina. We see this movement spread to Nashville, Atlanta, other major cities. What does this mean? So as part of a sit-in, student activists, again, these are really, really young activists who are amazingly courageous. They enter a segregated public space, like the grocery counter that you see here, and sit in a whites only area. And they'd be greeted with hollering. They'd be greeted with harassment. They'd be greeted with violence. And they'd meet that with nonviolence again, to try to expose the violence required to uphold Jim Crow laws and their very injustice. And then from the sit-in movement, we go from 1961 into the Freedom Rides, which we already talked about a little bit at the beginning. This is organized originally by the Congress for Racial Justice. And again, these are activists, civil rights activists going from the North to the South in efforts to desegregate buses and bus terminals. They're met with violence. Their buses are bombed. And importantly, you know, these are amazing acts of courage. Many of these incidents are caught on camera and then and, 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 and film and they end up being broadcast throughout the entire nation. They begin to, again, shift public opinion against the Jim Crow South and more in the direction of the goals of the civil rights movement. And then finally, Curry, as we get into 1963, we have two really big events there. One is the mass demonstration in Birmingham which was the largest demonstration to date. And again, we see civil rights activists, including children. They're marching in Birmingham. They're met by Bull Connor, the city's police commissioner in Birmingham, where orders the city's police to meet the marchers with violent force, things like dogs, cattle prods, high pressured fire hoses. Again, these images are built, beamed into television screens throughout America. Many Americans are appalled, but again, remember the courage that this would take. This would also lead to the arrest of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And then him authoring one of the great tracks in American political thought, the letter from a Birmingham jail. If you haven't read it, I urge you so strongly to do it. It's an amazing work of American political thought, political theory and political action. And then finally, as we're in 1963, we also get the famous March on Washington. The gathering meant to mark the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, attracting hundreds of thousands of people to Lincoln Memorial. And Dr. King emerges as the famous public image of this particular event with his I Have a Dream speech. But as Curry reminded us at the very beginning, and we hopefully have reminded you throughout this class, this isn't just a single person driving constitutional change, it's a broader movement. And all of these activities end up culminating following the ass tragic assassination of JFK uh, with a push in Congress for one of the canonical, most important laws ever passed in American history, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which attacks racial discrimination in a variety of settings, including work, schools, restaurants, hotels. And again, we would see Congress pass this law, it would emerge from the activities of the civil rights movement, and ultimately the Warren Court would step in and say yes, in a pair of opinions, yes, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it's strong constitutional medicine, but it is constitutional. That's what it said in Heart of Atlanta Motel versus United States, and also um, in Katzenbach versus McClung. Tom, good job rolling us there because we have one minute to wrap up. We're sorry, I knew we'd be five minutes late. There's just so much to continue to tell here, and so many people in the chat pointed it out already. You know, we have Brown versus Board of Ed in 1954, yet schools aren't desegregated until the 70s. Um, and schools are right now more segregated than they were in the 1980s. So this story doesn't end in these time periods. 
Um, the right after 1964, there's a push for voting rights. There's a bloody incident on Bloody Sunday in Selma between the police and John Lewis, who is right there, as well as other leaders that leads us to 1965 Voting Rights Act. And we can look at modern cases like Shelby v. Holder to have a discussion around these acts of Congress and how the courts have either supported them or deconstructed them. So, so many more stories to go on. So we hope this really exposes you to some of the key players, some amazing people, but also tells the story. It started long before the 1950s and it continues to go to today. So keep learning, keep diving into this and keep thinking about what are these civil rights and movements that we have to think about in our own generation today, in our own government today, in our own communities as well. So Tom, any final words as we wrap up class? I think that was wonderful, Curry. Oh, thanks. Okay, everybody, we will stay here for about 10 to 15 more minutes if you have any questions. And we thank you all so much for joining <coughs> us today. The email that I sent out this morning has a link to the PowerPoint, to the briefing document Tom wrote. It's basically like all of his notes. So it's fantastic read. Um, and also the videos will be on our YouTube channel. So we'll send them out by the end of the week. We're gonna stay for questions, but I wanted to thank you all very much. And with that, if you need to jump, go for it. I'm gonna stop recording. There we go. Okay, one question, Tom, that I know we had from the beginning, which is a great question. Did the Immigration Act ride on the waves of the Civil Rights Act? That's a great question. I, I can't say that I know enough about the, the, st the strategy behind <clears throat> each of them uh, to know how interconnected they were. I'd be shocked if it wasn't. It would be, I, I associate both of them more broadly with the sort of the, the governing and constitutional regime that existed at the time and many of its broad goals. And so um, that would be my guess, but I, 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 I can't say that I know with precision. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. I did not know either. So glad you were closer to that. Um, and let me just see if there's any more questions in that Q&A. You're all were awesome at sharing in the chat as well. Yep. And I will make sure you all get the link to the recording to go through. And I think that is it. You guys did a fantastic job. I really appreciate answering each other's questions in the chat too, and sharing other people that we should dive into. Yeah, you can go down a rabbit hole on Bull, Bull O'Connor as well. That would be the the na like the not great hero rabbit hole, but I like to go down. Or Bull well. yeah, same thing. Yes, oh Fabus, yes, and his his wife is still all over the um, courthouses there. Um, yeah, it's just weird. Um, really fascinating, amazing work going on in that area around the Equal Justice Initiative and like kind of pulling out these amazing, amazing moments of Montgomery. So thank you, Tom, that was fantastic. Thank you, students. Um, and there is a two o'clock class if you just wanna join us again and do a redo. Tom, you're not gonna talk for the next hour. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put, put the voice on ice. Although I have to say, after <laughs> mentioning Fabus, I'm now thinking of, there's a famous piece by the great jazz artist, Charles Mingus, that I might put on about Orville Fabus uh, that's critical of him that I might listen to in between. Ooh that uh, and sent it to us. I'll send it out at the end of the um, week roundup. I'm going to probably add a slide of Emmett Till. So I was like, oh yeah, we, I think we used to have Emmett Till in this conversation. Um, and I pulled him out, but I might put him back in and his mother. Um, awesome. Thank you, Tom. This was great. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. See you later. Have a good one. Bye everyone. Have a great Bye. day. Yes, I will. We will send you out an email that has the PowerPoint, the recording and the um, briefing document on there as well. So don't worry, I will make sure I get it out to you. I know it's a lot. I like to use the pictures to help remind us, but it's just to get the big ideas of we're fighting to our values and align them to our actions in the law, in the courts and in our classrooms uh, and in our communities. And then the other big idea that there's lots of different people so many people fought to make this happen over such a long period of time. And what is the, what is the work that we have to do today? So thank you everybody. Have a great day and see